The Rainmaker. It was many thousands of years ago when women ruled. In tribe and family, mothers and grandmothers were revered and obeyed. Much more was made of the birth of a girl than of a boy. There was an ancestress in the village a hundred or more years ago whom everyone revered and feared as if she were a queen, although in the memory of man she'd seldom lifted a finger or spoken a word. Many a day she sat by the entrance to her hut, a retinue of ministering kinsfolk around her, and the women of the village came to pay their respects, to tell her their affairs, to show her their children, and ask her blessing on them. The pregnant women came to ask her to touch their bellies and name the expected child. Sometimes the tribal mother would give the touch, sometimes she only nodded or shook her head, or else remained motionless. She rarely said anything. She was merely there, sitting and ruling, sitting with her yellowish-white hair falling in thin strands around her leathery, far-sighted eagle's face, sitting and receiving veneration, presents, requests, news, reports, accusations, sitting and known to all as the mother of seven daughters, and the grandmother and ancestor of many grandchildren and great-grandchildren, sitting and holding in those wrinkled features in back of that brown forehead the wisdom, the tradition, the law, the morality, and the honor of the village. It was a spring evening, overcast, the darkness falling early. The ancient herself was not sitting in front of the mud hut. In her stead was her daughter, almost as white-haired and stately and not much younger. She sat and rested. Her seat was the threshold, a flat field stone covered with the skin and cold water. At a little distance from her, a few children, women, and boys squatted in a semicircle in the sand or grass. They squatted here every evening that it was not raining or too cold, for they wanted to hear the ancient's daughters tell stories or sing spells. Formerly, the ancient herself had done this, but now that she was too old and no longer communicative, her daughter took her place. Just as she had learned all the stories and spells from the old woman, so she also had her voice, her figure, the quiet dignity of her bearing, her movements, and her language. The younger listeners knew her much better than her mother and by now scarcely realized that she sat here in another's place, passing on the tales and wisdom of the tribe. The wellspring of knowledge flowed from her lips on these evenings. She preserved the tribe's treasure under her white hair. Behind her gently furrowed old brow dwelt the memory and the mind of the village. Anyone who knew any spells or stories had learned them from her. Aside from her and the ancient, there was only one other guardian of knowledge in the tribe, but he remained hidden most of the time. A mysterious and extremely silent man, the Rainmaker, or as he was also called, the Weathermaker. Crouching among the listeners was also the boy Necht, and beside him a little girl named Ada. He was fond of this girl, often played with her and protected her, not out of love, for he knew nothing of that as yet, was still too much of a child, but because she was the Rainmaker's daughter. Necht adored the Rainmaker. Next to the Ancient and her daughter, he admired no one so strongly as the Rainmaker. But the others were women. You could venerate and fear them, but you could not conceive the thought could not possibly cherish the wish to become what they were. The Rainmaker was a rather unapproachable man. It was not easy for a boy to stay near him. That had to be managed in roundabout ways, and one of these roundabout ways to the Rainmaker was next concern for his child. As often as possible, he went to the Rainmaker's somewhat isolated hut to fetch her. Then he would sit with her, listening to the old woman's tales, and later take her home. He had done this today, and now he was squatting beside her in the dark group, listening. Today, the old woman was telling about the witch's village. Sometimes there's a wicked woman in a village who wishes harm to everyone. Usually, these women conceive no children. Sometimes one of these women is so wicked that the village will no longer let her stay. Then the villagers go to her hut at night. Her husband is fettered, and the woman is beaten with switches and driven far out into the woods and swamps. She is cursed with a curse and left there. Soon, the husband's fetters are removed, and if he is not too old, he can take himself another wife, but if the expelled woman does not die, she wanders about in the woods and swamps, learns the language of animals, and when she has roamed long enough, sooner or later she finds her way to a small village that is called the Witch's Village. There all the wicked women who have been driven from their villages have come together and made a village of their own. There they live, do their wickedness, and make magic, but especially because they have no children of their own. They like to coax children from the proper villages, and when a child is lost in the woods and never seen again, it may not have drowned in the swamp or been eaten by a wolf, but led astray by a witch and taken to the witch's village. In the days when I was still little, and my grandmother was the eldest in the village, a girl once went to pick bilberries with the others, and while she was picking, she grew tired and fell asleep. 
She was small. The ferns hid her from sight, and the other children moved on and did not notice until they were back in the village and it was already evening. Then they saw that the girl was no longer with them. The young men were sent out. They searched and came in the woods until night, and then they came back and had not found her. But the little girl, after she had slept enough, went on and on in the woods. And the more frightened she became, the faster she ran. But she no longer had any idea where she was, and only ran farther away from the village, deeper and deeper into wild country. Around her neck, on a strip of bast, she wore a boar's tooth that her father had given her. He had brought it back from the hut, and with a stone tool bored a hole through the tooth so that the bast could be drawn through it. And before that he had boiled the tooth three times in boar's blood and sung good spells, and anyone who wore such a tooth was protected against many kinds of magic. Now a woman appeared from among the trees. She was a witch. She put on a kindly face and said, Greetings, pretty child. Have you lost your way? Come along with me. I'll take you home. The child went along, but she remembered what her mother and father had told her, that she should never let a stranger see the boar's tooth. So while she walked, she slipped the tooth off the strip of bast and tucked it into her belt without being noticed. The woman walked for hours with the girl. It was already night when they reached the village, but it was not our village. It was the witch's village. There the girl was locked up in a dark stable, but the witch went to sleep in her hut. In the morning, the witch said, Don't you have a boar's tooth with you? The child said no. She had had one, but she lost it in the woods, and she showed her necklace with the tooth missing from it. Then the witch took a clay pot filled with earth, and three plants were growing in the earth. The child looked at the plants and asked what they were. The witch pointed to the first plant and said, This is your mother's life. Then she pointed to the second and said, This is your father's life. Then she pointed to the third plant. And that is your own life. As long as the plants are green and growing, you are all alive and well. If one withers, then the one whose life it is falls sick. If one is pulled out, as I am going to pull one out now, then the one whose life it is will surely die. She took hold of the plant that meant the father's life and began tugging at it. And when she had pulled it out a little so that a piece of the white root could be seen, the plant gave a deep sigh. At these words, the little girl beside Neck sprang to her feet as if she'd been bitten by a snake, screamed, and ran headlong away. She'd been sitting for a long time fighting back the terror caused by the story until she could no longer endure it. One old woman laughed. Other listeners were almost as frightened as the little girl, but they controlled themselves and remained seated. But Neck, startled out of his trance of fear, also sprang up and ran after the girl. The old woman went on with her story. The rainmaker had his hut close to the village pond, and Neck looked for the runaway in this direction. He searched and tried to lure her out of hiding with coaxing, reassuring hums, and sing-songs and clucks, using the voice that women use to call chickens sweet, long, drawn-out notes intent on enchantment. Ada, he called and sang. Ada, little Ada, come here. Ada, here I am, Necked. He sang again and again. And before he had heard a sound from her or caught a glimpse of her, he suddenly felt her small, soft hand force its way into his. She had been standing by the path, pressed against the wall of a hut, and been waiting for him since hearing his first call. With a sigh of relief, she moved close to him. He seemed to her as tall and strong as a man. Were you frightened? he asked. You shouldn't be. No one will hurt you. Everyone likes Ada. Come, we'll go home. She was still trembling and sobbing a little, but was already calmer and went gratefully and trustfully along with him. Dim red light filtered through the doorway of the hut. Inside, the rainmaker sat stooped by the hearth. Yellow and red light gleamed through his flowing hair. The hearth fire was lit and he was boiling something in two small pots. Before entering with Ada, Necht watched curiously from outside for a few moments. He could see at once that whatever was being boiled was not food. That was done in different pots and besides, it was already much too late to prepare a meal. But the rainmaker had already heard him. Who is standing at the door? He called out. Step forward, come in. Is it you, Ada? He placed lids on his pots, raked glowing embers up against them, and turned around. Necht was still peering at the mysterious little pots. He felt curiosity, awe, and a sense of oppression all at once, as he always did whenever he entered this hut. He came here as often as he could, made up all sorts of pretexts for coming, but once he was here, he always felt this half-thrilling, half-warning sensation of slight uneasiness, of eager curiosity and pleasure, warring with fear. 
The old man knew that Necht had long been trailing after him, turning up as he did at odd moments in unlikely places. The boy was pursuing him like a hunter following a spore, and mutely offering his services and his company. Turu, the rainmaker, looked at him with his bright hawk's eyes. What are you doing here? he asked coolly. This is no time of day for visits to strange huts, my boy. I've brought Anna home, Master Turu. She was listening to the mother tell stories about witches, and all of a sudden she was so frightened she screamed, so I walked her home. The rainmaker turned to his daughter. You're too timid, Ada. Sensible little girls need not fear witches. You're a sensible little girl, aren't you? Yes, but the witches know all sorts of wicked tricks, and if you don't have a boar's tooth... I see. You like to have a boar's tooth, all right. But I know something even better. A special root I'll give you. We'll look for it in the autumn. It protects sensible girls from all kinds of magic, and even makes them prettier. Ada smiled happily. She was already reassured now that the smell of the hut and the familiar firelight surrounded her. Shyly, Necht asked, Couldn't I help look for the root? If you would only describe the plant to me. Turu's eyes narrowed. A good many little boys would like to know that, he said, but his voice did not sound angry, only slightly mocking. There's time for that. Perhaps in the autumn. Next slipped away and went to the youth house where he slept. He had no parents. He was an orphan. For that reason, too, he was entranced by Ada and her hut. Turu the Rainmaker was not fond of words. He did not like to hear himself or others talking. Many tribesmen thought him peculiar, and some sullen. But he was neither. He knew what was going on around him, or at any rate knew more than anyone would have expected in a man seemingly so solitary, absent-minded, and full of learning. Among other things, he knew quite well that this somewhat bothersome but handsome and evidently clever boy was running after him and observing him. He had noticed this as soon as it began, for it had been going on a year or longer now. He knew, too, exactly what it meant. It meant a great deal for the boy's future, and also meant a great deal for him, the rainmaker. It meant that this boy had fallen in love with rainmaking and was longing to learn the art. Every so often there would be such boys in the village, and they would begin to hang about him, much as this boy was doing. Some could easily be discouraged and frightened away, others not, and he had taken on two of them as his disciples and apprentices. Both had married into other villages far away and were the rainmakers or simples gatherers there. Since then, Turu had been alone, and if he ever again took another apprentice, it would be to train him as his own successor. That was how it had always been, that was how it ought to be, and it could be no other way. A gifted boy always had to turn up and attach himself to the man whom he saw as the master of his craft. Necht was talented. He had what was needed. He also had several signs to commend him, above all the look in his eyes, at once piercing and dreamy, the reserve and quiet in his manner, and in the expression of his face and the carriage of his head something questioning, scenting, and alert, an attentiveness to noises and smells. There was something of the hawk and something of the hunter about him. Surely this boy could become a weather maker, perhaps a magician also. He could be taught, but there was no hurry. The boy was still too young and there was no reason to show him that he had been recognized. Apprenticeship must not be made too easy for him. He must go the whole way himself. If he could be intimidated, deterred, shaken off, discouraged, he would be no great loss. Let him wait and serve. Let him creep around and pay court. Next sauntered through the gathering night, under a cloudy sky with two or three stars, he made his way into the village, content and happily excited. This village knew nothing of the luxuries, beauties, and refinements which we today take for granted, and which even the poorest among us regard as indispensable. The village had no culture and no arts. Its only buildings were the crooked mud huts. It knew nothing of iron and steel tools. Even wheat and wine were unknown. Inventions such as candles or lamps would have seemed dazzling wonders to these people. But next life and the world of his imagination were no poorer on that account. The world surrounded him like a picture book full of inexhaustible mysteries. Every day he conquered another little piece of it, from the animal and plant life to the starry sky. And between mute, mysterious nature and the breathing soul in his solitary, nervous, boyish frame, there dwelt all the kinship and all the tension, anxiety, curiosity, and craving for understanding of which the human soul is capable. Although there was no written knowledge in his world, no history, no books, no alphabets, and although everything that lay more than three or four hours walk beyond his village was totally unknown and unreachable, he nevertheless lived fully and completely in his village and the things that were his. The village, home, the community of the tribe under the guidance of the mothers gave him everything that nation and state can give a man. 
a soil filled with thousands of roots among whose intricate network he himself was a fiber, sharing in the life of all. Contentedly, he sauntered along. The night wind whispered in the trees, branches creaked. There were smells of moist earth, of reeds and mud, of the smoke of wood still partly green, an oily and Swedish smell that meant home more than any other. And finally, as he approached the youth hut, there was its smell, the smell of boys, of young men's bodies. Noiselessly, he ducked under the reed mat, into the warm, breathing darkness. He settled into the straw and thought about the story of the witches, the boar's tooth, Ada, the rainmaker, and his little pots in the fire, until he fell asleep. Turu only grudgingly yielded to the boy's importunity. He did not make it easy for him, but the youth was always on his trail. Something drew him to the old man, though he himself often did not know what it was. Sometimes when the rainmaker was off somewhere in a remote spot in the woods, swamp, or heath, setting a trap, sniffing the spore of an animal, digging a root, or collecting seeds, he would suddenly feel the boy's eyes upon him. Invisible, making no sound, Neck had been following him for hours, watching his every move. Sometimes the rainmaker would pretend not to notice. Sometimes he growled and ungraciously ordered the boy to make himself scarce. But sometimes he would beckon him and let him stay for the day, would assign him tasks, show him one thing or another, give him advice, set tests for him, tell him the names of plants, order him to draw water or kindle fires. For each of these procedures, he knew special tricks, knacks, secrets, and formulas which must, he impressed this on the boy, be kept strictly secret. And finally, when Necht was somewhat older, he took him from the youth house into his own hut, thus acknowledging the boy as his apprentice. By that act, Necht was distinguished before all the people. He was no longer one boy among others. He was the rainmaker's apprentice, and that meant that if he bore up and amounted to something, he'd be the next rainmaker. From the moment the old man took Necht into his hut, the barriers between them dropped. Not the barrier of veneration and obedience, but of distrust and constraint. Turu had submitted. He had allowed Neck to conquer him by tenacious courtship. Now he wanted nothing more than to make a good rainmaker and successor of the boy. In this course of instruction, there were no concepts, doctrines, methods, scripts, figures, and only very few words. The master trained Neck's senses far more than his intellect. A great heritage of tradition and experience, the sum total of man's knowledge of nature at that era, had to be administered, employed, and even more passed on. A vast and dense system of experiences, observations, instincts, and habits of investigation was slowly and hazily laid bare to the boy. Scarcely any of it was put into concepts. Virtually all of it had to be grasped, learned, tested with the senses. The basis and heart of this science was knowledge of the moon, of its phases and effects as it waxed and waned, peopled by the souls of the dead whom it sent forth into new births in order to make room for the newly dead. Like that evening when he had escorted the frightened Ada to her father's hearth, another time was deeply etched on Neck's memory. This was a time when the master woke him two hours after midnight and went out with him in deep darkness to show him the last rising of a vanishing crescent moon. The master in motionless silence, the boy somewhat tremulous, shivering from lack of sleep, they waited a long time on a ledge of a rock in the midst of the forested hills, watching the spot indicated by the master until the thin, gently curving line of the moon appeared in the very position and shape he had described beforehand. Fearful and fascinated, Nick stared at the slowly rising heavenly body. Gently it floated between dark banks of clouds in an island of clear sky. Soon it will change its shape and wax again. Then will come the day to sow the buckwheat, the rainmaker said, counting out the days on his fingers. Then he lapsed into silence again. Nick crouched as if he were alone on the rock gleaming with dew. He trembled with cold. From the depths of the forest came the long-drawn call of an owl. The old man pondered for a long while. Then he rose, placed his hand on Neck's hair, and said softly, as if awakening from a dream, When I die, my spirit will fly into the moon. By then you will be a man and need a wife. My daughter Ada will be your wife. When she has a son by you, my spirit will return and dwell in your son, and you will call him Turu, as I am called Turu. The apprentice heard all of this in astonishment. He did not dare say a word. The thin silvery sickle rose and was already half devoured by the clouds. A strange tremor passed through the young man, an intimation of many links and associations, repetitions and cross-currents among things and events. He felt strangely poised, both as spectator and participant, against this alien night sky, where the thin, sharp crescent, precisely predicted by the master, had appeared above endless woods and hills. 
How wonderful the master seemed, and veiled in a thousand secrets. He who could think of his own death, whose spirit would live in the moon, and return from the moon back into a person who would be next son and bear the former master's name. The future, the fate before him, seemed strangely torn asunder, in places transparent as the cloudy sky. And the fact that anyone could know it, define it, and speak of it seemed to throw open a view into incalculable spaces, full of wonders, and yet also full of orderliness. For a moment, it seemed to him that the mind could grasp everything, know everything, hear the secrets of everything. The soft, sure course of the planets above, the life of man and animals, their bonds and hostilities, meetings and struggles, everything great and small, along with the death locked within each living being. He saw or felt all this as a whole in a first shudder of premonition, and himself fitted into it, included within it, as a part of the orderliness, governed by laws accessible to the mind. This first inkling of the great mysteries, their dignity and death, as well as their knowability, came to the young man in the coolness of the forest as night moved toward morning, and he crouched on the rock above the multitude of whispering treetops. It came to him, touched him like a ghostly hand. He could not speak of it, not then and never, in his whole life, but he could not help thinking of it many times. In all his further learning and experiencing, the intensity of this hour was present in his mind. Think of it, it reminded him. Think that all this exists, that there are rays and currents between the moon and you and Turu and Ada, that there is death and the land of the souls and a returning therefrom, and that in your heart there's an answer to all the things and sights of the world, that everything concerns you, that you ought to know as much about everything as it's possible for a man to know. Something like this was what the voice said. For Necht, this was the first time he heard the inner voice speaking thus, heard the seductive and imperative bidding of man's spirit. He had seen many a moon wander across the sky, and heard many a nocturnal owl shrieking, and laconic though the master was, he'd heard many a word of ancient wisdom or of solitary reflection from his lips. But at this moment, something new and different had struck him. Presentiment of wholeness, the feeling for connections and relations, for the order that included him and gave him a share in the responsibility for everything. If you had the key to that, you did not need to depend on footprints to recognize an animal, or roots or seeds to know a plant. You'd be able to grasp the whole world, stars, spirits, men, animals, medicines, and poisons, to grasp everything in its wholeness and to discern in every part and sign, every other part. There were good hunters who could read more than others in a track, in fumets, a patch of fur and remains. They could say from a few tiny hairs not only what kind of animal these came from, but also whether it was old or young, male or female, from the shape of a cloud, a smell in the air, the peculiar behavior of animals or plants. Others could foretell the weather for days in advance. His master was unsurpassed in this art, and nearly infallible. Still others had an inborn skill. There were boys who could hit a bird with a stone at thirty paces. They had not learned it. They could simply do it. It did not come by effort, but by magic or grace. The stone in their hand flew off by itself. The stone wanted to hit, and the bird wanted to be hit. There were said to be others who knew the future, whether a sick man would live or die, whether a pregnant woman would give birth to a boy or a girl. The tribal mother's daughter was famous for this, and the rainmaker too was said to possess some of this knowledge. There must, it seemed to Neck at this moment, be a center in the vast net of associations. If you were at this center, you could know everything, could see all that had been and all that was to come. Knowledge must pour in upon one who stood at this center, as water ran to the valley and the hair to the cabbage. His word would strike sharply and infallibly as the stone in the sharpshooter's hand. By virtue of the mind's power, he would unite all these wonderful gifts and abilities within himself, and use them at will. He would be the perfect, wise, insurpassable man. To become like him, to draw nearer to him, to be on the way to him, that was the way of ways, that was the goal, that gave sacredness and meaning to a life. Something like this was the way he felt, and our attempts to speak of it in our conceptual language, which he could never know, convey nothing of the awe and the passion of his experience. Rising at night, being led through the dark, still woods full of dangers and mysteries, waiting on the ledge in the chill of night and early mornings, the appearance of the thin phantom of a moon, the wise master's few words, being alone with the master at so extraordinary an hour, all this was experienced and preserved by Necht as a solemn mystery, as a solemn initiation, as his admission into a league and a cult, into a humble but honorable relationship to the unnameable, the cosmic mystery. 
This and many another similar experience could not be put into thoughts, let alone words, even more remote from his way of thinking. Even more impossible than any other thought would have been words such as this. Is it only I alone who have created this experience, or is it objective reality? Does the master have the same feelings as I, or would mine amuse him? Are my thoughts new, unique, my own? Or have the master and many before him experienced and thought exactly the same? No. For him, there was no such analyses and differentiations. Everything was reality, was steeped in reality, full of it as bread dough is of yeast. The clouds, the moon, the shifting scenes in the theater of the sky, the cold, wet limestone under his bare feet, the damp, trickling cold dew in the pallid night air, the comforting home-like smell of hearth smoke and bed of leaves suffusing the skin the master had slung around him, the dignity and the faint note of old age and readiness for death in his rough voice. All that was beyond reality and penetrated almost violently into the boy's senses. And sense impressions are a deeper soil for growing memories than the best systems and analytical methods. Although the Rainmaker was one of the few members of the tribe who had an occupation, who had developed a special art and ability, his everyday life outwardly did not differ greatly from that of the other members of the tribe. He was an important man with considerable prestige. He also received payment from the tribe whenever he had to do some service for the community. But this happened only on special occasions. By far, his most important and sacred function came in the spring when he determined the proper day for sowing every kind of fruit and plant. He did this by carefully considering the state of the moon, partly by handed down rules, partly by his own experience. But the solemn act of opening the season of seeding, the strewing of the first handful of grain and seeds on the community land, was no longer part of his office. That task was too high for any mere man. It was performed every year by the tribal mother herself or by her oldest female relative. The master became the principal person in the village only when he really had to function as weather maker. This happened when a long drought or a long spell of damp and cold struck the fields and threatened the tribe with famine. Then Turu had to apply the methods effective against drought and poor crops, sacrifices, exorcisms, processions. According to legend, in cases of obstinate drought or endless rain, when all other means failed and the spirits could not be moved by persuasion, pleas, or threats, there was a last infallible method used in the days of the mothers and grandmothers, sacrifice of the weather maker himself by the community. The tribal mother, it was said, had witnessed one such sacrifice. Aside from looking after the weather, the master also had a kind of private practice as an exorcist, as a maker of amulets and charms, and in some cases as a doctor, wherever medical matters were not reserved to the tribal mother. But for the rest, Master Turu lived the life of every other tribesman. He helped to till the common land when his turn came, and he also had his own small garden near the hut. He gathered and stored fruit, mushrooms, and firewood. He hunted and fished, and kept a goat or two. As a farmer, he was like all the others, but as hunter, fisherman, and herb gatherer, he was not like anyone else. Rather, he was a solitary genius with a reputation for knowing a great many natural and magical tricks, devices, knacks, and aids. It was said he could weave a willow noose which no animal could escape. He had special recipes for fish bait. He knew how to lure crayfish, and there were some who thought that he understood the language of many a beast. But his real specialty was more arcane. Observation of the moon and the stars, knowledge of the weather signs, ability to forecast weather and growth, and a command of many magical effects. Thus, he was a great collector of plant and animal materials efficacious for remedies and poisons, for working magic, for conferring blessings, and for fending off dangerous spirits. He knew where to find even the rarest plants. He knew when they blossomed and ripened seed, and the right time to dig their roots. He knew where to find all kinds of snakes and toads, knew how to use horns, hoofs, claws, hair. He knew what to do with growths, deformities, weird and horrible excrescences knots, tumors, burls, and scales, of wood, of leaves, of grain, of nuts, of horns and hoofs. Necht had more to learn with his feet and hands, his eyes, skin, ears, and nose, than with his intellect, and Turu taught far more by example and by dumb show than by words and prescription. The master rarely spoke coherently, and even when he did, his words were only a supplement to his singularly impressive gestures. Next apprenticeship differed little from the apprenticeship a young hunter or fisherman undergoes with a good master, and it gave him great pleasure, for he learned only the things that were already latent within him. He learned to be in wait, to listen, to stalk, to watch, to be on his guard, to be alert, to spy and sense. But the game that he and his master stalked was not only fox and badger, otter and toad, bird and fish, but essence, the whole, meaning, relationship. 
they sought to determine, to recognize, to guess and forecast the fleeting, unstable weather, to know the death lying hidden in a barrier snake bite, to eavesdrop on the secret relations between clouds or storms and the phases of the moon, relations that affected the growth of crops as they did the haleness or doom of man and beast. No doubt they were really seeking the same ends as the science and technology of later centuries, dominance over nature and a control of her laws, but they went about it in an entirely different way. They did not stand off from nature and try to penetrate into her secrets by violence. They were never opposed and hostile to nature, but always part of her and reverently devoted to her. It is quite likely that they knew her better and dealt more wisely with her. But one thing was utterly impossible for them. Not even in their most audacious moments would it have occurred to them to meet nature in the world of spirits without fear, let alone to feel superior to them. Such hubris was unthinkable. They could not have imagined having any other attitude but fear toward the forces of nature, toward death and the demons. Fear loomed over the life of man. It could not be overcome. But it could be pacified, outwitted, masked, brought within bounds, placed within the orderly framework of life as a whole. The various systems of sacrifices served this purpose. Fear was the permanent pressure upon the lives of these people, and without this high pressure their life would have lacked stress, of course, but also lacked intensity. A man who had been able to ennoble his fear by transforming part of it into awe had gained a great deal. People of this sort, people whose fear had become a form of piety, were the good men and the progressive men of that age. There were many sacrifices and many kinds of sacrifice, and a certain portion of these sacrifices, with their accompanying rites, fell within the province of the weathermaker. Alongside Necht in the hut, little Ada grew up, a pretty child, the old man's darling, and when he thought the time had come, he gave her to his disciple for a wife. From this point on, Necht was considered the rainmaker's assistant. Turu presented him to the village mother as his son-in-law and successor, and thereafter allowed him to carry out many official acts and functions as his deputy. Gradually, as the sessions and years passed, the old rainmaker lapsed into the solitary meditativeness of age and left all his duties to Necht. By the time the old man was found dead, crouched over some small pots of magic brew on the hearth, his white hair singed by the fire, the boy, the disciple Necht, had long been familiar to the village as the rainmaker. He demanded that the village council provide an impressive funeral for his teacher, and as a sacrifice burned a whole heap of precious medicinal herbs and roots over the grave. That, too, had happened long ago, and several of Nek's children already crowded Ada's hut, among them a boy named Turu. In him, the old man had returned from his death flight to the moon. Nek fared much as had his teacher in times past. Part of his fear was transformed into piety and thought. Part of his youthful aspiration and his profound longings remained alive. Part faded away and evaporated as he grew older in his work, in his love and solicitude for Ada and the children. His foremost passion was still for the moon and its influence upon the seasons and the weather. To this he devoted persistent study, and in knowledge of these matters he reached and ultimately surpassed his master, Turu. And because the waxing and waning of the moon are so closely bound up with the birth and death of men, because of all the fears in which men live, fear of having to die is the strongest, Necht acquired from his adoration and knowledge of the moon a devout and purified attitude toward death. In his riper years he was less subject to the fear of death than other men. He could speak reverently with the moon, or supplicatingly or tenderly. He knew that he was linked to it by delicate spiritual bonds. He knew the moon's life with great precision, shared with all the force of his own soul in the episodes of the moon's destiny. He experienced its disappearance and rebirth like a mystery within himself, suffered with it, felt alarm when the dreaded event occurred and the moon seemed exposed to illness and dangers, change and harm, when it lost its brightness, changed color, darkened until it seemed on the verge of extinction. At such times, it was true, everyone sympathized with the moon, trembled for it, recognized menace and the imminence of disaster and its eclipse, and stared anxiously at its old, ravaged face. But precisely at such times, Rainmaker Necht showed that he was closer to the moon and knew more about it than others. For although he shared in its suffering, although his heart constricted with anxiety, his memory of similar experiences was keener, his confidence better founded. He had greater faith in eternity and a second coming, and the possibility of revising and conquering death. Greater, too, was the degree of his devotion. At such times he felt in himself a readiness to share the fate of the celestial orb to the point of doom and rebirth. At times he even felt something akin to temerity, a kind of rash courage, and the resolution to defy death by the power of mind, to strengthen his own selfhood by surrender to superhuman destinies. Some trace of this was apparent in his manner. 
Others sensed it and regarded him as knowing and devout, a man of great calm and little fear of death, one who stood well with the higher powers. He had to prove these gifts and virtues in many hard tests. Once he had to withstand a period of poor crops and adverse weather that extended over two years, it was the greatest trial of his life. Troubles and bad portents had become with the repeatedly postponed sowing, and then every imaginable misfortune had affected the crops, until in the end they were virtually destroyed. The village had starved cruelly, and necked the rainmaker with it. It was a considerable achievement in itself to have survived this bitter year without losing all credence and standing, so that he could still help the tribe bear the catastrophe with humility and some degree of composure. When the next year, after a hard winter in which many of the tribe perished, all the miseries of the preceding year were repeated, when during the summer the common land parched and cracked in a stubborn drought, the mice multiplied fearfully, and the solitary conjurations and sacrifices of the rainmaker proved as vain as the public ceremonies, the drum choruses, and the processions of the whole community. When evidence mounted that this time the rainmaker could not make rain, it was no small matter and more than ordinary strength was needed to bear the responsibility and hold up his head against the frightened and infuriated people. There were two or three weeks in which Necht stood entirely alone, confronting the entire village, confronting hunger and despair, confronting the ancient belief among the people that only sacrifice of the weathermaker could propitiate the powers. He had won the victory by yielding. He had not opposed the idea, had offered himself as a sacrifice. Moreover, with enormous toil and devotion, he had helped to alleviate distress, had repeatedly discovered sources of water, divining a spring here, a trickling stream there. Even in a time of greatest distress, he had not allowed the villagers to slaughter all of their livestock. Above all, he had lent his support to the tribal mother, who had succumbed to fatalism and weakness in these difficult times. By advice, threat, magic, and prayer, by example and intimidation, he saved her from collapsing completely and letting everything drift wildly. In those times of calamity and universal anxiety, it became apparent that a man is the more useful, the more his life and thinking is turned toward matters of the spirit, matters that go beyond the personal realm, the more he has learned to venerate, observe, worship, serve, and sacrifice. The two terrible years, which had almost cost him his life, ended with his being more highly regarded and trusted than ever, not by the thoughtless crowd, of course, but by the few who bore responsibility and were able to judge a man of his type. His life had passed through these and many other trials by the time he reached the best years of his maturity. He had officiated over the burial of two of the tribal mothers, had lost a charming six-year-old son who had been carried off by a wolf. He had survived a severe illness without outside help, acting as his own physician. He had suffered hunger and cold. All this had marked his face, and his soul no less. He had also made the discovery that, in a certain peculiar manner, men of thought gave offense and aroused the repugnance of their fellows. They might be valued at a distance and called on in emergencies, but others neither love them nor accept them, rather give them a wide berth. He had also learned that the sick and unfortunate are far more receptive to traditional magic spells and exorcisms than to sensible advice, that people more readily accept affliction and outward penances than the task of changing themselves or even examining themselves, that they believe more easily in magic than reason, in formulas than experience. These are matters which in the several thousand years ago since his era have probably not changed so much as a good many history books claim. But he had also learned that a seeking, thoughtful man dare not forfeit love, that he must meet the wishes and follies of men halfway, not showing arrogance, but also not truckling to them, that it is always only a single step from sage to charlatan, from priest to mountebank, from helpful brother to parasitic drone, and that the people would by far prefer to pay a swindler and be exploited by a quack than accept help given freely and unselfishly. They would much rather pay in money and goods than in trust and love. They cheat one another and expect to be cheated themselves. You had to learn to see man as a weak, selfish, and cowardly creature. You also had to realize how many of these evil traits and impulses you shared yourself, and nevertheless you allowed yourself to believe and nourished your soul on the faith that man is also spirit and love, that something dwells in him which is at variance with his instincts and longs to refine him. But all of these thoughts are no doubt far too abstract and explicit for Neck to have been capable of them. Let us say, he was on the way to them, his way would someday lead him to them and pass them. While he went his way, longing for abstract thought but living far more in the senses, in the spell of the moon, in the pungency of an herb, the saltiness of a root, the taste of a piece of bark, 
in cultivating simples, blending selves, submitting to the whims of weather and atmosphere. He developed many abilities within himself, including some that we of a later generation no longer possess and only half understand. The most important of these abilities was, of course, rainmaking. Although there were a good many special times when the sky stayed obdurate and seemed to mock his efforts, Necht nevertheless made rain hundreds of times, and almost every time in a slightly different way. He would, of course, never have dared to make the slightest change or omission in the sacrifices and the rite of processions, conjurations, and drumming. But that was only the official, the public part of his work, the priestly side, which was for show, and undoubtedly it was very fine and produced a fine exalted feeling when after a day of sacrifices and processions the sky gave way in the evening, the horizon clouded over, the wind began to smell damp, the first drops of rain splattered down. But it had taken the weather maker's art to choose the day well, not to strive blindly when the prospects were poor. You could implore the powers, even besiege them, but you had to do so with feeling and moderation, with submission to their will. Even more than those glorious triumphant experiences of felicitous intercession, he preferred certain others that no one but himself knew about, and even he knew about them only timorously, more with his senses than his understanding. There were weather conditions, tensions of the atmosphere and of heat, cloud formations and winds, smells of water and earth and dust, threats and promises, moods and whims of the weather demons, which Neck detected in advance with his skin, his hair, with all his senses, so that he could not be surprised by anything, could not be disappointed. He concentrated the very vibrations of the weather within himself, holding them within him in such a way that he could command the clouds and the winds, not to be sure, just as he pleased, but out of the very intimacy and attachment he had with them, which totally erased the difference between him and the world, between inside and outside. At such times he could stand rapt, listening, or crouch rapt, with all his pores open, not only feel the life of the winds and clouds within his own self, but also direct and engender it, somewhat in the way we can awaken and reproduce within ourselves a phrase of music that we know by heart. Then he needed only to hold his breath, and the wind or the thunder stopped. He needed only to nod or shake his head, and the hail pelted down or ceased. He needed only to express by a smile the balance of the conflicting forces within himself, and the billows of clouds would part, revealing the thin, bright blueness. There were many times of unusually pure harmony and composure in his soul when he carried the weather of the next few days within himself with infallible foreknowledge, as if the whole score were already written in his blood in such a way that the outside world must play every note exactly as it stood. Those were his best days, his reward, his delight. But when his intimate connection with the outside was broken, when the weather and the world were unfamiliar, incomprehensible, and unpredictable, then currents were interrupted and derangements occurred within him. Then he felt that he was not a real rainmaker, that his responsibility for weather and crops was an error and nuisance. At such times he was domestic, behaved obediently and helpfully toward Ada, sedulously shared the household task with her, made toys and tools for the children, pottered about preparing medicines, craved love, and wanted nothing better than to differ as little as possible from other men, to conform wholly to them in customs and morals, and even to listen to the otherwise vexatious gossip of his wife and the neighboring women about the life, health, and conduct of others. But in good times his family saw little of him, for then he roamed, fished, hunted, searched for roots, lay in the grass or crouched in trees, sniffed, listened, imitated the voices of animals, kindled little fires, and compared the shapes of the smoke clouds with the clouds in the sky, drenched his skin and hair with fog, rain, air, sun, or moonlight, and incidentally gathered, as his master and predecessor Turu had done in his lifetime, objects whose inner character and outward form seemed to belong to different realms, in which the wisdom of whimsicality of nature seemed to reveal some fragment of her rules and secrets of creation, objects which seemed to unite symbolically widely disparate ideas, gnarled branches with the faces of men or animals, water-polished pebbles grained like wood, petrified animals of the primordial world, misshapen or twinned fruit pits, stones shaped like kidneys or hearts. He read the veinings of a leaf, the pattern of a mushroom cap, the divined mysteries, relations, futures, possibilities, the magic of symbols, the foreshadowing of numbers and writing, the reduction of infinitudes and multiplicities to simplicity, to system, to concept. For all these ways of comprehending the world through the mind no doubt lay within him, nameless, unnamed, but not inconceivable, not beyond the bounds of presentiment, still in the germ, but essential to his nature, part of him, 
growing organically within him. And if we were to go still further back beyond this rainmaker in his time, which to us seems so early and primitive, if we were to go several thousands of years further back into the past, wherever we found man, we would still find, this is our firm belief, the mind of man, that mind which has no beginning and always has contained everything that it later produces. The weather maker was not destined to win immortality by any one of his premonitions or to come any closer to proving their validity. For him, indeed, they scarcely needed proof. He did not become one of the many inventors of writing, nor of geometry, nor of medicine or astronomy. He remained an unknown link in the chain, but a link as indispensable as any other. He passed on what he had received, and he added what he had newly acquired by his own struggles, for he too had disciples. In the course of the years, he trained two apprentices to be rainmakers, one of whom was later to become his successor. For long years, he had gone about his affairs and practiced his craft alone and unobserved. Then, shortly after great crop failure and time of famine, a boy started approaching, watching him, spying on him, adoring him, and generally skulking about. One who was drawn to rainmaking and the master. With a strange, sorrowful tug at his heart, he sensed the recurrence and reversal of the great experience of his youth, and at the same time had that austere feeling, at once constricting and stirring, that afternoon had set in, that youth was gone and noonday passed, that the blossom had become a fruit. And to his own surprise, he behaved toward the boy exactly as old Turu had once behaved toward him. The stiff rebuff, the delaying, wait-and-see attitude came of its own accord, it was neither an imitation of his deceased master, nor did it spring from moralistic and pedagogic considerations that a young man must be tested for a long time to see whether he is serious enough. That initiation into mysteries should not be made easy, in similar theories. On the contrary, Neck simply behaved toward his apprentices the way every somewhat aging solitary and learned eccentric behaves toward admirers and disciples. He was embarrassed, shy, distant, ready for flight, fearful for his lovely solitude and his freedom to roam in the wilderness, to go hunting and collecting alone, to dream and listen. He was full of a jealous love for all his habits and hobbies, his secrets and meditations. There could be no question of his embracing the timid youth who approached him with worshipful curiosity. No question of helping him overcome this timidity by encouraging him. No question of his rejoicing and having a sense of reward, appreciation, and pleasant success because the world of the others was at last sending him an emissary and a declaration of love. Because someone was courting him, someone felt drawn to him, and like himself, called to the service of mysteries. On the contrary, at first he felt it merely as a troublesome disturbance, infringement on his rights and habits, loss of his independence. For the first time, he realized how much he prized that independence. He resisted the wooing and became clever at outwitting the boy and hiding himself, at covering his tracks, evading, and escaping. But what happened to Turu now happened to him also. The boy's long, mute courtship slowly softened his heart, slowly, slowly wore down his resistance, so that the more the boy gained ground, the more Neck learned to turn to him and open his mind to him, approve his longing, accept his courtship, and eventually come to regard the new and often vexatious duty of teaching and having a disciple as inevitable, imposed by fate, one of the requirements of a life of thought. More and more, he had to bid farewell to the dream, the feeling and the pleasure of infinite potentialities, of a multiplicity of futures. Instead of the dream of unending progress, of the sum of all wisdom, his pupil stood by, a small, near, demanding reality, an intruder and nuisance, but no longer to be rebuffed or evaded. For the boy represented, after all, the only way into the real future, the one most important duty, the one narrow path along which the rainmaker's life and acts, principles, thoughts, and glimmerings could be saved from death and continue their life in the small new bud. Sighing, gnashing his teeth, and smiling, he accepted the burden. But even in this important, perhaps most responsible aspect of his work, the passing on of tradition and the education of successors, the weathermaker was not spared bitter disillusionment. The first apprentice who sued for his favor was named Morrow, and when after long delay and every form of deterrence he accepted the boy, Morrow disappointed him in a way he could never quite reconcile himself to. The boy was obsequious and wheedling, and for a long time pretended unconditional obedience, but he had certain faults. Above all, he lacked courage. He was especially afraid of night and darkness, a fact he tried to hide. Necht, when he noticed it at last, continued for a long time to regard it as lingering childishness which would eventually disappear. But it did not disappear. 
This disciple also completely lacked the gift of selfless devotion to observation for its own sake, to the procedures and processes of the rainmaker's work, and to ideas and speculations. He was clever, had a quick, bright mind, and he learned easily and surely whatever could be learned without surrender of the self. But it became more and more apparent that he had self-seeking aims, and that it was for the sake of these that he wanted to learn rainmaking. Above all, he wanted status. He wanted to count for something and make an impression. He had the vanity of talent, but not a vocation. He longed for applause. As soon as he acquired some scraps of knowledge and a few tricks, he showed off to his fellows. This, too, could be considered childish and might be outgrown. But he wanted more than applause. He also strove for power and advantages over others. When the master first began to notice this, he was alarmed and gradually withdrew his favor from the young man. Maro had been an apprentice for some years when Necht caught him in serious misdemeanors. One time he was induced, in return for presents, to treat a sick child with medicines without his master's knowledge and authorization. Another time he undertook on his own to rid a hut of rats by reciting spells. And when, in spite of all his master's warnings and his own pledges, he was caught again in similar practices, the master dismissed him, informed the tribal mother of the affair, and tried to banish the ungrateful and useless young man from his memory. His two later disciples compensated for this disappointment, especially the second, who was his own son, Turu. He deeply loved this youngest and last of his apprentices, and believed the boy could become greater than himself. Plainly, his grandfather's spirit had returned in him. Necht experienced the invigorating satisfaction of having passed down the sum of his knowledge and belief to the future, and of having a person who was his son twice over, to whom he could hand over his duties any time these became too heavy for him. But still, that ill-favored first disciple could not be dismissed from his life and thoughts. In the village, Maro became a man who, while not especially enjoying high honor, was nevertheless extremely popular and wielded considerable influence. He had taken a wife, amused many people by his talents as a kind of mountebank and jester, and had even become chief drummer in the drum corps. He remained a secret enemy of the Rainmaker, consumed by envy and inflicting large and small injuries upon him whenever he could. Necht had never had a gift for friendship and gregariousness. He needed solitude and freedom. He had never sought out respect or love, except for the time he was a boy seeking to win over Master Turu. But now he learned how it felt to have an enemy, someone who hated him. It spoiled a good many of his days. Maro had been one of those highly talented pupils who, in spite of their talent, are always unpleasant and a grief to their teachers because their talent has not grown from below and from within. It is not founded on organic strength, the delicate and nobling mark of a good endowment, of sound blood and a sound character, but is in a curious way something adventitious, accidental, perhaps even usurped or stolen. A pupil of meager character but high intelligence or sparkling imagination invariably embarrasses the teacher. He is obliged to transmit to this pupil the knowledge and methodology he himself has inherited and to prepare him for the life of the mind and yet he cannot help feeling that his real and higher duty should be to protect the arts and sciences against the intrusion of young men who have nothing but talent. For the teacher is not supposed to serve the pupil, rather, both are the servants of their culture. This is the reason teachers feel slightly repelled by certain glittering talents. A pupil of that type falsifies the whole meaning of pedagogy as service. All the help given to a pupil who can shine but cannot serve basically means doing harm to service and is, in a way, a betrayal of culture. We know of periods in the history of many nations in which profound upheavals and cultural processes led to a surge of the merely talented into leading positions in communities, schools, academies, and governments. Highly talented people sat in all sorts of posts, but they were people who wanted to rule without being able to serve. Certainly, it's often very difficult to recognize such people in good time before they have entrenched themselves in the intellectual professions. It's equally difficult to treat them with the necessary ruthlessness and send them back to other occupations. Necht, too, had made mistakes. He had been patient far too long with his apprentice, Maro. He had entrusted esoteric knowledge to a superficial climber. There was a pity, and the consequences for himself were far greater than he could ever have foreseen. A year came, by then Necht's beard was already quite gray, in which the orderly relationships between heaven and earth seemed to have been distorted by demons of unusual strength and malevolence. These distortions began in the autumn with events of such fearful majesty that every soul in the village shook with terror. Shortly after the equinox, which the rainmaker always observed with heightened attentiveness and celebrated with solemnity and reverent worship, there was a display in the heavens that could not occur within the memory of man. An evening came that was dry, windy, and rather cool. 
The sky was crystal clear except for a few restless small clouds which floated at a very great height, holding the rosy light of the setting sun for an unusually long time. They looked like loose and foamy bundles of light drifting in cold, pale, cosmic space. For several days past, Necht had sensed something that was stronger and more remarkable than the feeling he had every year at this time when the days began growing shorter. A seething of the powers in the sky, a sense of alarm in earth, plants, and animals, a nervousness in the air, something inconstant, expectant, frightened, lowering in all of nature. The small clouds with their lingering, quivering flames formed part of the strangeness. Their fluttery movements did not correspond with the direction of the wind on the ground. After a long, sad struggle against extinction, their piteous red light grew cold and faded, and suddenly they were invisible. It was quiet in the village. The circle of children before the tribal mother's hut had long scattered. A few boys were still chasing about and tussling, but all the rest of the tribe were in their huts. Everyone had eaten. Many were already asleep. Scarcely anyone but the rainmaker observed the twilight clouds. Necht walked back and forth in the small garden behind his hut, pondering the weather, tense and restive. At times he sat down for a brief rest on a stump that stood among the nettles and served him for splitting wood. As soon as the last glimmer of cloud was extinguished, the stars suddenly appeared against the greenish glow of the sky and rapidly grew in number and brightness. Where there had been only two or three visible a moment before, there were now ten, twenty. The rainmaker was familiar with many of them individually and in their groups and families. He had seen them many hundreds of times. There was always something reassuring about their unvarying reappearance. Stars were comforting. Though they hung so high, remote and cold, radiating no warmth, they were reliable, firmly aligned, proclaiming order, promising duration. Seemingly so aloof and far and opposed to life on earth, seemingly so untouched by the warmth, the writhings, the sufferings and ecstasies in the life of man, so superior in their cold majesty and eternity that they seemed to make mock of human things. The stars nevertheless had a relation to us. They guided and governed us, perhaps, and if any human knowledge, any intellectual hold, any sureness and superiority of the mind over transitory things could be attained and retained, it would resemble the stars, shining like them in cool tranquility, comforting with chilly shivers of awe, looking down eternally and somewhat mockingly. That was how they had often seemed to the rainmaker, and although he felt toward the stars nothing like the close, stimulating, constantly changing and recurring relationship he had toward the moon, the great, near, moist orb, the fat, magic fish in the sea of heaven, he nevertheless revered them and attached many beliefs to them. To gaze at them for a long time and allow their influence to work upon him, to expose his intelligence, his warmth, his anxiety to their serenely cold gaze, often laved and assuaged him like a healing draft. Tonight, too, they looked as they always did, except that they were very bright and seemed highly polished in the taut, thin air, but he could not find within himself the repose to surrender to them. From unknown realms, some power was tugging at him. It ached in his pores, sucked at his eyes, quietly and continually affected him. It was a current, a warning quiver. In the hut nearby, the warm, dim light of the hearth fire glimmered. Life flowed small and warm inside, a cry, a laugh, a yawn. Human smells, skin warmth, motherhood, children's sleep. All that innocent presence seemed to deepen the night to drive the stars still further back into the incomprehensible distances and heights. And now, while Necht heard Ada's voice inside the hut crooning and humming a low melody as she quieted a child, there began in the sky the calamity that the village would remember for many years. A flickering and glimmering appeared here and there in the still, glittering network of stars, as if the usually invisible threads of the net were suddenly leaping into flame like hurled stones, glowing and guttering, a few stars fell slantwise across the sky, one here, two there, a few more here, and before the eye had turned from the first vanished falling star, before the heart, stilled at the sight, had begun to beat again, the lights falling or hurled at a slant or a slight arc across the sky began to come in swarms of dozens, hundreds, a countless host, born on a vast mute storm, they slanted across the silent night, as if a cosmic autumn were tearing all the stars like withered leaves from the tree of heaven and flinging them noiselessly into the void. Like withered leaves, like wafting snowflakes, they rushed away and down, thousands upon thousands, in fearful silence, vanishing beyond the wooded mountains to the southeast where never a star had set since time immemorial. With frozen heart and swimming eyes, Neck stood, head tilted back, gazing horrified but insatiably at the transformed and accursed sky, mistrusting his eyes and yet only too certain of the direness of what they beheld. 
Like all who watched this nocturnal spectacle, he thought the familiar stars themselves were wavering, scattering, and plunging down, and he expected that if the earth itself did not swallow him first, the firmament would soon appear black and emptied. After a while, however, he recognized what others could not know, that the well-known stars were still present, here and there and everywhere, that the frightful dispersion was taking place not among the old, familiar stars, but in the space between earth and sky, and that these new lights, fallen or flung, so swiftly appearing and swiftly vanishing, glowed with the fire of another sort from the old, the proper stars. This was somewhat reassuring and helped him regain his balance. But even if these were new, transitory, different stars scattering through the air, still it meant disaster and disorder. Deep sighs came from Neck's parched throat. He looked toward the earth. He listened to find out whether this uncanny spectacle were appearing to him alone, or whether others were also seeing it. Soon he heard groans, screams, and cries of terror from other huts. Others had seen it too. Their cries had alarmed the sleepers and the unaware. In a moment, panic had seized the entire village. With a sigh, Neck took the burden on himself. This misfortune affected him, the rainmaker, above all others, for he was in a way responsible for order in the heavens. Always before, he had known or sensed great catastrophes in advance, floods, hailstorms, tempests. Always he had warned the mothers and elders to be prepared. He had averted the worst evils. He had interposed himself, his knowledge, his courage, and his confidence in the powers above, between the village and consternation. Why had he foreknown nothing this time, so that he could take no measure? Why had he said not a word to anyone of the obscure foreboding he had, after all, felt? He lifted the mat hung over the entrance of the hut and softly called his wife's name. She came, her youngest at her breast. He took the baby from her and laid it on the pallet. Holding Ada's hand, he placed a finger to his lips, enjoining silence, and led her out of the hut. He saw her patiently tranquil face grow distorted by terror. Let the children sleep. I don't want them to see this. Do you hear? He whispered intensely. Don't let any of them come out, not even Turu. And you yourself stay inside. He hesitated, uncertain how much to say, how many of his thoughts he ought to reveal. Finally, he added firmly, nothing will harm you and the children. She believed him at once, although her face and her mind had not yet recovered from the fright. What is it? She asked, again staring at the sky. Is it very bad? It is bad, he said gently. I think it may be very bad, but it doesn't concern you and the children. Stay in the hut, keep the mat drawn. I must talk to the people. Go in, Ada. He pressed her through the opening, drew the mat carefully closed, and stood for the span of a few breaths with his face turned toward the continuing rain of stars. Then he bowed his head, sighed heavily once more, and walked swiftly through the night toward the tribal mother's hut. Half the village was already assembled there. A muted roar rose from them, a tumult half numbed by terror and choked by despair. There were women and men who surrendered with a kind of voluptuous rage to their sense of horror and impending doom. Some stood still, wrapped. Others jerked about wildly with uncontrolled movements of their limbs. One woman was foaming at the mouth as she danced, alone, a despairing and obscene dance, at the same time pulling out whole handfuls of her long hair. Next realized that the effects were already at work. Almost all had succumbed to the intoxication. They were bewitched or driven mad by the falling stars, and an orgy of madness, fury, and self-destructiveness might follow. It was high time to collect the few brave and sensible members of the tribe and support their courage. The ancient tribal mother was calm. She believed that the end of all things had come, and that there was nothing to be done about it. Toward the inevitable, she showed a firm, hard face that looked almost mocking in its pinched astringency. He persuaded her to listen to him. He tried to show her that the old stars, the ones that had always been, were still in the sky. But she could not grasp it, either because her eyes no longer had the strength to discern them, or because her conception of the stars was too unlike the rainmakers. She shook her head and maintained her courageous grin, but when Necht implored her not to abandon the people to their terror, she instantly was of his mind. A small group of frightened but not yet maddened villagers still willing to be led formed around her and the weathermaker. Up to the moment he reached the group, Neck had hoped to be able to check the panic by example, reason, speech, explanations, and encouragement, but his brief conversation with the tribal mother had shown him that it was too late for anything of the sort. He had hoped to let the others share in his own experience, to make them a gift of it. He had hoped to persuade them that the stars themselves were not falling, or not all of them, that no cosmic storm was sweeping them away. He had imagined that by such urging he'd be able to move them from helpless dismay to active observation, so that they would be able to bear the shock. But he quickly saw that there were very few villagers who would hearken to him, and by the time he won them over, all the others would have utterly given way to madness. 
No, as was so often the case, reason and sensible speech could accomplish nothing here. Fortunately, there were other means. Although it was impossible to dispel their mortal terror by appeal to reason, this terror could still be guided, organized, given shape, so that the confusion of maddened people could be made into a solid unity. The wild, single voices merged into a chorus. But there was no time to be lost. Next stepped before the people, loudly crying the well-known prayers that opened public ceremonies of penance and mourning, the lament for the death of a tribal mother, or the ceremony of sacrifice and atonement in the face of perils such as epidemics and floods. He shouted the words in rhythm and reinforced the rhythm by clapping his hands, and in the same rhythm, shouting and clapping his hands all the while, he stooped almost to the ground, straightened up, stooped again, and straightened up. Almost at once, ten or twenty others joined in his movements. The white-haired mother of the village murmured in the same rhythm and with tiny bows sketched ritual movements. Those who were still flocking to the assemblage from the huts at once joined in the beat and the spirit of the ceremony. The few who had gone off their heads collapsed and lay motionless, or else were caught up in the murmur of the chorus and the religious genuflections. His method was effective. Instead of a demoralized horde of madmen, there now stood a reverent populace prepared for sacrifice and penance, each one benefiting, each one encouraged by how having to lock his horror and fear of death within himself or bellow it crazily for himself alone. Each now fitted into his place in the orderly chorus of the multitude, keeping to the rhythm of the exorcistic ceremony. Many mysterious powers are present in such a rite. Its greatest comfort is its uniformity, confirming the sense of community. Its infallible medicine, meter and order, rhythm and music. While the whole night sky was still covered by the host of falling stars, like a rushing, silent cascade consisting of droplets of light, for another two hours it went on squandering its red globules of fire. The horror in the village changed to submission and devotion, to prayers to the powers and penitential feelings. In their fear and weakness, men met the disorder of the sky with order and religious concord. Even before the reign of stars began to slacken, the miracle had taken place. The inner miracle radiated healing powers, and by the time the sky seemed slowly to be quieting down and recovering, all the dead tired penitents had the redeeming feeling that their worship had placated the powers and restored order in the heavens. That night of terror was not forgotten. The village talked about it all through the autumn and winter. But soon this was no longer done in timorous whispers, but in an everyday tone of voice. And with that satisfaction that people feel when they look back upon a disaster faced and withstood, a peril successfully overcome. The villagers now battened on details. Each had been surprised in his own way by the incredible event. Each claimed to have been the first to discover it. Some ventured to make fun of those who'd been particularly shaken by it. For a long time, a certain amount of excitement persisted in the village. There had been a great event. Something extraordinary had happened. Neck did not share this mood, or feel the same gradual loss of interest in the phenomenon. For him, the whole uncanny experience remained an unforgettable warning, a thorn that continued to prick him. He could not dismiss it on the grounds that it had passed, that the danger had been averted by processions, prayers, and penances. The further it receded in time, in fact, the greater its importance became for him, because he filled it with meaning. It gave full scope to his tendency to brood and interpret. The event in itself, the whole of that miraculous natural spectacle, had been an enormously difficult problem involving many aspects. A man who had once seen it could probably spend a lifetime pondering it. Only one other person in the village would have watched the reign of stars from a kindred point of view and on the basis of similar knowledge. This was his own son and disciple, Turu. Only what this one witness would have said, to bear out or to revise his own observation, would have mattered to Neck. But he had let this son sleep, and the longer he wondered why he had done so, why he had refrained from sharing the sight of the incredible event with the only eyewitness whose judgment he would have taken seriously, the more convinced he became that he had acted rightly, obeying a wise instinct. He had wanted to spare his family the sight, including his apprentice and associate, had wanted to spare him especially, for he loved no one so much as Turu. For that reason, he had concealed the rain of falling stars from him, had defrauded him of the sight. He believed in the good spirits of sleep, especially of the sleep of youth. Moreover, if he had remembered rightly, the first sight of the heavenly sign had scarcely seemed to betoken any momentary danger to the lives of the villagers. Rather, he had instantly decided that the event was an omen of future disaster, and one that concerned no one so closely as himself, the weather maker. The calamity, when it came, would strike him alone. Something was in the offing, a threat from that realm with which his office linked him. No matter what the form in which it came, he would be the one who would chiefly bear its brunt. To keep himself alert to this danger, to oppose it resolutely when it came, to prepare his soul and accept it but not let it intimidate or dishonor him, such was the resolve he came to, such was the command he thought he'd received from the great omen. 
The danger that loomed would call for a mature and courageous man. For that reason, it would not have been well to draw his son into it, to have him as a fellow sufferer, or even as a partner in the knowledge. For although he thought so highly of his son, he did not know whether a young and untested person would be able to cope with the menace. His son Turu, however, was most unhappy because he had slept through the great spectacle. No matter how it was interpreted, it had been a great thing in any case, and perhaps nothing of the sort would happen all the rest of his life. For quite a while he was resentful toward his father on that account. Necht overcame the resentment by increased attentiveness and affection. He drew Turu more and more into all the duties of his office. In anticipation of things to come, he took greater pains to complete Turu's training and make him as perfect an initiate and successor as possible. Although he rarely spoke with him about the reign of stars, he admitted him with less and less restraint into his secrets, his practices, his knowledge and researches, and allowed the boy to accompany him on his walks and investigations of nature, and to join him in experiments. All this he had previously shared with no one. The winter came and passed, a damp and rather mild winter. No more stars fell, no great and unusual things happened. The village was reassured. Diligently, the hunters went out looking for game. On racks beside the huts hung stiffly frozen bundles of hides, clacking against one another in windy weather. Loads of wood were dragged in from the forest on long, smooth boards that rolled lightly over the snow. It happened that just during the brief period of hard frost, an old woman died. She could not be buried at once. For some days, until the ground thawed again, the frozen corpse was laid out beside the door of her hut. The spring partly confirmed the weathermaker's forebodings. It was a dreary, joyless spring, without ardor and sap, betrayed by the moon. The moon was always tardy. The various signs that determined the day of sowing never coincided. In the forest, the flowers blossomed sparsely. Buds shriveled on the twigs. Necht was deeply troubled, but did not show it. Only Ada, and especially Turu, could see how anxious he was. He not only undertook the usual incantations, but also made private sacrifices, boiling savory, aromatic brews and infusions for the demons, as well as cutting his beard short on the night of the new moon and burning it in a mixture of resin and damp bark that produced heavy smoke. He postponed as long as possible the public ceremonies, the village sacrifices, the processions, and the drum choruses. As long as possible he kept the accursed weather of this evil spring as his private concern. But eventually, when the usual time for sowing was already many days past, he had to report to the tribal mother. Sure enough, here too he encountered misfortune and trouble. The old tribal mother, who was his good friend and had rather maternal feelings for him, did not receive him. She was ill, lying in bed, and had handed over all her duties to her sister. This sister, as it happened, was distinctly cool toward the rainmaker. She did not have the older woman's austere, straightforward character, was rather fond of distractions and frivolities, and hence had taken a liking to Morrow, the drummer and mountebank, who knew how to entertain and flatter her. And Morrow was Neck's enemy. Neck sensed at their first conversation her coolness and dislike, although she in no way questioned his proposals. He urged that they postpone the sewing for a while longer, as well as any sacrifices or processions. She agreed to this, but she had received him icily and treated him like a subordinate. She refused his request to see the sick tribal mother, or at least to be allowed to prepare medicine for her. Necht returned from this interview dejected, feeling poorer and with a bad taste in his mouth. For half a moon, he tried in his own way to make weather which would permit sowing. But the weather, which had so often followed the same direction as the currents within him, remained unmanageable. It mocked all his efforts. Neither spells nor sacrifices worked. The rainmaker had no choice. He had to go to the tribal mother's sister again. This time he was virtually pleading for patience, for postponement, and he realized at once that she must have spoken with that clown Morrow about him and his affairs. For in the course of the conversation on the necessity of setting the day for sowing, or else ordering ceremonies of public prayer, the old woman showed off her knowledge and used a few expressions which she could only have learned from Morrow, the former rainmaker's apprentice. Necht asked for three days' grace and then decided that the constellation was more favorable. He set the sowing for the first day of the third quarter of the moon. The old woman consented and pronounced the ritual words. The decision was proclaimed to the village, and everyone prepared for the rite of sowing. But now, when everything seemed to be in hand for a while, the demons again showed their malice. On the very day of the longed-for and carefully prepared sowing, the old tribal mother died. The ritual sowing had to be postponed and her funeral prepared instead. It was celebrated with great solemnity. Behind the new village mother, with her sisters and daughters, the rainmaker took his place and the robes reserved for great processions wearing his tall, pointed fox fur headdress. He was assisted by his son, Turu, who struck the two-toned hardwood clappers together. 
Great honors were shown to the deceased and to her sister, the new tribal mother. Maro, leading the drummers, kept in the forefront of the mourners and won much attention and applause. The village wept and celebrated, lamented and feasted, enjoyed the drum music and the sacrifices. It was a fine day for all, but the sewing had again been put off. Nick stood through it all with dignity and composure, but he was profoundly saddened. It seemed to him that along with the tribal mother, he was burying all the good days of his life. Soon afterward, at the request of the new tribal mother, the sewing was likewise celebrated with special magnificence. Solemnly, the procession marched around the fields. Solemnly, the old woman scattered the first handfuls of seed on the common land. To either side of her walked her sisters, each carrying a pouch of grain into which the eldest dipped her hand. Necht breathed a little easier when the ceremony was finally completed. But the seed sowed so festively was destined to bring no joy and no harvest. It was a merciless year. Beginning with the relapse into wintry frost, the weather indulged in every imaginable caprice and spite that spring. In summer, when meager crops at last covered the fields thinly, half as tall as they should have been, the last blow of all came, an incredible drought, the worst anyone could remember. Week after week, the sun blazed in a white haze of heat. The smaller brooks dried up. Only a muddy marsh remained of the village pond, a paradise for dragonflies and a monstrous brood of mosquitoes. Deep cracks gaped in the parched earth. The villagers could see the crops withering. Now and then clouds gathered, but the lightning storms remained dry. If a brief shower fell, it was followed by days of a parching east wind. Lightning often struck tall trees, setting fire to their withered tops. Turu, Nek said to his son one day, this will not turn out well. We have all the demons against us. It began with the falling stars. I think it is going to cost me my life. Remember this. If I must be sacrificed, assume my office at once and insist that my body will be burned and my ashes strewn on the fields. You will suffer great hunger through the winter, but the evil spells will be broken. You must see to it that no one touches the community's seed grain under penalty of death. Next year will be better, and people will say, good that we have the new young weather maker. There was despair in the village. Morrow incited the people. Frequently, threats and curses were shouted at the rainmaker. Ada fell sick and lay shaken by vomiting and fever. The processions, the sacrifices, the long, heart-throbbing drum choruses were useless. Neck led them, for that was his duty, but when the people scattered again, he stood alone, shunned by all. He knew it was necessary, and he knew also that Maro had already besieged the tribal mother with demands that he be sacrificed. For his own honor and his son's sake, he took the last step himself. He dressed Turu in the ceremonial robes, went to the tribal mother with him, and proposed him as his successor, at the same time offering himself as a sacrifice. She looked at him for a short while with a curious, searching glance. Then she nodded and assented. The sacrifice was carried out that same day. The whole village would have attended, but many lay sick with dysentery. Ada, too, was gravely ill. Turu, in his robes, with the tall fox fur headdress, all but collapsed from heat stroke. All the dignitaries and leaders of the village who were not ill joined in the procession, including the tribal mother with two of her oldest sisters, and Maro, the chief of the drum corps. Behind them followed the mass of the villagers. No one insulted the old rainmaker. The procession was silent and dejected. They marched to the woods and sought out a large circular clearing that Necht himself had appointed as the site of the sacrifice. Most of the men had their stone axes with them to cut wood for the funeral pyre. When they reached the clearing, they placed the rainmaker in the center, and the dignitaries of the village formed a small ring around him, with the rest of the crowd in a larger circle on the outside. There was an indecisive, embarrassed silence, until the rainmaker himself spoke. I was your rainmaker, he said. I did my work as well as I could for many years. Now the demons are against me. Nothing I do succeeds. Therefore, I have offered myself for a sacrifice. That will placate the demons. My son Turu will be your new rainmaker. Now kill me, and when I am dead, do exactly as my son says. Farewell. And now who will be my executioner? I recommend the drummer Maro. He is surely the right man for the task. He fell silent. No one stirred. Turu, flushed deeply under the heavy fur headdress, gave a tormented look around the circle. His father's mouth twisted mockingly. At last the tribal mother stamped her foot furiously, beckoned to Maro, and shouted at him, Go ahead! Take the axe and do it! Maro, axe clutched in his hands, posted himself before his former teacher. He hated him more than ever. The lines of scorn around those silent old lips irked him bitterly. He raised the axe and swung it over his head. 
Taking aim, he held it aloft, staring into the victim's face, waiting for him to close his eyes. But Neck did not. He kept his eyes wide open, fixed steadily on the man with the axe. They were almost expressionless, but what expression there was hovered between pity and scorn. In fury, Morrow flung the axe away. I won't do it, he murmured, and pressing through the circle of dignitaries, he lost himself in the crowd. Several villagers laughed softly. The tribal mother had turned pale with rage, as much at Morrow's uselessness and cowardice as at the arrogance of the rainmaker. She beckoned to one of the oldest men, a quiet, dignified person who stood leaning on his axe and seemed to be ashamed of this whole unseemly scene. He stepped forward and gave the victim a brief, friendly nod. They had known each other since boyhood, and now the victim willingly closed his eyes. Necht closed them tightly and bowed his head a little. The old man struck with the axe. Necht fell. Turu, the new rainmaker, could not say a word. He gave the necessary orders with gestures alone. Soon the pyre was heaped up and the body lay on it. The solemn ritual of making fire with two concentrated sticks was Turu's first official act. 